Hi everyone, and it's our pleasure to bring you part two of the Lucky Fish Boat Tour. Now, some of you might remember uh, this bucket from our Atlantic crossing. Now, who would have thought a bucket could become such a topic of conversation? Yeah. <laughs> We've been really amused by a lot of the comments. Um, some of you have suggested that uh, you know, this bucket go into a museum in Mongolia. One or two of you have been wondering what happened to Toya. We read one very humorous suggestion that she was last seen in Home Depot, shopping for a new bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and someone else suggested that they are willing to fly us a new bucket. Anyway guys, it really does make our day when we hear stuff like that, but we really want to mention George. George offered to buy the bucket. Now let me tell you a little bit about George. George is a patron of something like 18 sailing channels. George, we think you're awesome. You support Lucky Fish, you support the big ones, you support the small ones. Mate, I can see you really enjoy sailing channels like we all do. So George, the very least we can do. Yeah, thank you George. The, the very least we can do mate is send you this bucket free of charge, we're going to get a lovely plaque engraved, we're going to sign it, it's going to be our, our gift to you and, uh, and our sincerest thanks mate for um, you know supporting the media and the creators out there who are bringing the entertainment for, for all of us. Uh, in the meantime if any of you people would like to become patrons of Lucky Fish Channel uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, we've got links in the description below. We've got uh, links at the end of the video So go ahead support us and you might get a bucket one day, too <laughs> All right guys back to the boat tour. Thanks everyone So one of the first things people say when they step on board Lucky Fish is uh, how much room there is on the deck It's something that contrasts these boats against the bridge house catamarans you see more often and she really has got a lot of space, more space than we know what to do with. One of the things that attracted us to the boat was this big swim ladder, swim come swim platform and also dinghy hatch. You know, we're able to put the tacker cat up that ramp and just stow it sort of laterally along this uh, aft deck area. Uh, with the dinghy ramp raised, it's another area to walk around on, it's quite secure. Uh, it just pulls up and down on that rope purchase system there and then there's a couple of stainless steel plates that uh, rotate and engage with the aluminium frame to give you a good secure deck. So there's a little uh, base here for the post for the barbecue. We just bring the gas bottle out here, mount the barbie and it's a really good area for uh, cooking up the very rare fish that we catch. Right at the back of the boat, this black beam is not structural. Um, it's actually what Warham calls a netting beam. Normally this would be a, an area clo enclosed by a fishing net or something similar, trampoline. Uh, the builder of this boat went for a semi-solid deck, uh, which has obviously added a bit of weight to the back of the boat, but nothing too, too bad. Uh, he seems to float on her marks all right. He's kept it light. See tiller steering on twin rudders linked together with a tiller bar. Uh, we've got a removable steering line which goes down through two turning blocks there and then forward under the deck and then up through the steering pedestal area uh, and around a drum. Lucky Fish has got some strong mooring cleats, uh, both bow and stern, with big backing plates. One of the things I really like about the boat, it's certainly strongly engineered in the areas that really matter. Uh, rope lifelines which are just 8mm uh, braid. There's our vane steering unit on the starboard hull, that one's Romeo, without the vane attached. And you can see more of Romeo in, uh, in another video dedicated to the vane steering system. Uh, behind the wheel, simple matter to unscrew that, take the wheel off with the electric drill, just buzz out these screws, lift the panel off and then we've got access to the uh, Simnet backbone in here with the radar hooked up to the chart plotter, depth, wind, log, all that's connected on the Simnet. 12 volt cigarette lighter attachment which we use for charging phones, running our little 12 volt bush shower which is a beauty. It's got a decent rural pump for that which is a submersible, goes straight into one of the 20 litre jerrys. 
and a little waterproof on off switch and a shower rose so it's almost civilized. The nav gear is pretty standard, 12 inch touch screen chart plotter, triton gauge showing wind, depth and hull speed through the water, a windless control switch and this is the ignition panel for the twin outboards. Throttle and gear levers, tilt switches, jib sheet winches, this is a bilge pump, a couple of useful open pocket lockers for just about everything. A watertight locker where everything else goes. We've got a uh, quite a bright torch in there, binoculars, and at the back of that is our AIS transponder in a nice dry spot, and that's where the power comes in from the uh, starboard battery bank. Another little pocket to the side here, sun creams and goodness knows what. At the aft end of the cockpit. There's a handy little table propped up by a stainless leg. There are two winches that are for the spinnaker sheets and guys. The pod has a handy seating area across the back with built-in lockers. There's storage for fishing rods under the bimini and the gas locker is located under the port seat. Under this cockpit seat, we just retain it with a shock cord here attached to the winch. We keep the vane steering on top of course so it's easy access but underneath there we've got um, instrument covers, barbecue, uh, snorkeling gear, fishing gear, yeah that's about it. And under the starboard cockpit seat, there's just one hatch, which accesses uh, the full length of the seat. And we use this one, this is the workshop. Pretty much all tools, spare parts and everything goes in there. On top of the Bimini we have 270 watts of solar power, GPS antenna, the dome for the 4G broadband radar, these are the throat and peak halyards for the mainsail. There are really handy handholds here. These are indispensable for moving around the boat, going up and down companionways, or moving about the deck day or night when the boat is pitching and rolling. The bimini also doubles as a rain catcher. One thing we really appreciate in the tropics is the open bridge deck design allowing unobstructed airflow over the cockpit. A cockpit pod designed like this depends on a storm enclosure. Ours is pretty flexible. It has lots of zips and clear windows and we can adjust it to whatever the weather. It uses rubber bungees and hooks to hold it down and only takes the two of us a couple of minutes to fully enclose or open the pod. As the boat only weighs 5 tonnes fully laden, the sails are relatively small and easily managed by hand. The gaff schooner design keeps the centre of effort low down, helping earn these boats an unequalled safety record. The foresail and main are soft wing sails, minimising drag from the masts. There's, there's, a, there's a bit of a trick to hoisting a gaff sail. You've got to keep the, uh, the throat halyard tight and the head of, or the, the, the throat of the sail or the leading edge of the sail considerably higher than the gaff when you're hoisting and lowering it otherwise the gaff binds on the mast. It's only once you've got the luff of the sail fully tensioned that you then tension the gaff and hoist that to its full hoist. That is the trick. At the base of the main mast there's a solid piece of wood which forms the mast foot and it sits on another solid piece of wood atop that beam there uh, that intermediate beam. A solid pad eye there uh, with our 6 to 1 
main sheet system coming off that. It's a dual main sheet system. This is for the foresail, uh, and that's the other side there. So we can. This is centrally sheeted, and this one is variable. So this also attaches to the clue of the foresail, but we can uh, attach one end of it down to that pad eye there, or out or to the pad eye right out there. Um, obviously, for different sheeting positions. Quite a good system. Um, you can play with it. It's one of the things about the Warren rig. You can do a lot of uh, adjustments and playing around. There's really no right way. Um, and then there's a lot of scope for individuals to, to play and try and get the most out of their boat. This is the forestay bridle, attached to the bows and joined in the middle at the chain plate at the base of the roller furler. The furler is a plastimo, quite a small unit, as the jib isn't large. This is the foresail, fully lowered but raised above the foremast truss so we can see inside. So all the sail controls for raising and lowering the foresail are here. Uh, the centrally located winch, which is quite handy, does a number of jobs. Uh, hoist the jib halyard, uh, which is a once only sort of thing, given that it's a furler. It also uh, hoists the throat and gaff halyards for the foresail and can be used for staysail sheeting. Also use it now for the hydro generator to raise and lower it when we're underway. Uh, I dare say we use it for other things as well, which I've forgotten. But having everything in the centre of the boat like that, or the winch there, and blocks on the outboard ends of this beam, means that if we're playing around with sheeting positions on the foresail, or on the staysail, then we can lead the sheet straight into this winch. The Tiki 38 has lovely wide side decks set inboard for added safety. Let's have a look at the engine area. Under this locker here we have spare fuel can, about 24 litres. Under here is the access to the starboard engine with its fuel container attached. The engines and fuel tanks are sensibly located in the middle of the boat to reduce hobby horsing. First step is to release the upline line. It just lowers down to its retaining strops there at the correct height. The engines are fully retractable, eliminating drag under sail. Raising it is just the opposite. doing a video, a separate video on the installation and performance of that unit uh, coming out shortly. But in the meantime, I'll show you quickly how we uh, raise and lower it. One of the things that's uh, pretty neat about the Warham is the use of rope for hinges, even on the running edges. Um, this is a deck hatch and the cockpit area, which is used for everything. Taking a leak at sea in pretty secure conditions in the middle of the boat. Uh, to uh, you know, gutting fish, getting rid of anything you like down there. Um, I really like it. I think it's neat to have a view of the sea straight under your boat. Uh, and these neat little rope hinges which um, don't rust, don't require any maintenance. The rope ever dies, it's just a matter of replacing it. So we stayed with the rope idea when we installed the hydro uh, generator. We made another little deck hatch here so we could get at the uphaul and downhaul lines for it. So that one just opens up like that. Lower the generator, unbeating the, the uphaul line, which is this white one. I'll just pull it out of the cam feet there. Bang, and then let it go. side engine, same as the starboard. This lock is a little different. On the starboard side it was used for the spare fuel locker, on this side it's the battery 
for uh, starting the engines and the windlass. In there is a uh, solar controller to charge this battery from the panels and here's the uh, windlass relay and the remote to complement the one in the uh, steering station. That's that. Our primary anchor is a 20 kilo rockner which is buried in the sand somewhere out there. We have two solid anchoring cleats here for the secondary anchor which is a 5 kilo fortress and for the storm anchor which is a 15 kilo fortress. This is the bridle made from stretchy nylon anchor plate. A solid alloy bow roller fitting leads back to a horizontal windlass as we only have a shallow chain locker. The mast box, which is a truss between the two forward beams, contains all the primary anchor road and chain on one side and deck brushes, boat hook and fishing gaff along with the secondary anchor road on the port side. A unique feature of the Warrams are the rope lashings which bind the hulls to the beams. We just re-lashed the boat in Grenada using the technique we learned from Hokulea and we'll share the process and the results in a future video. Suffice to say here that the boat is now really stiff with a really noticeable increase in performance. Alright. Oh, look at it? Yeah. Well, hope you guys enjoyed our boat tour, much as we did enjoy bringing it to you. We hope you didn't forget anything, but if we did, uh, please drop us a line in the comments section below, or find us on our website, send us an email, or look for us on Facebook. We're always happy to talk things warm. In the meantime, from Lucky Fish, until the next episode, bye everyone! Galley. Okay. At the back end of this galley is the cat. Oh shit! Cabin! <laughs> <laughs> hey. At the back end of this cabin is the galley. Come back out. You get out of the bloody okay. shot. Come back here. <laughs> right, now ready. At the back end of this cabin is the galley. Galley. Stupid word. At the back end of this cabin is the kitchen. Alright, and this is the... <laughs> okay guys, we hope you enjoyed that boat tour of Lucky Fitch's. <laughs> Serious face. Okay. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our video much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. <laughs> I don't even know what my line is. My line is uh, forgotten. Didn't... It's all scripted. Hope we did not forget anything. Yeah, that's right.